Mark Schlichting. Yeah. So, back in the day, oh, back in the day, hey, look, the mouse disappeared. Dang it. A dongle or whatever. Back in the day, this was what computers looked like. And there was nothing personal about them. And kids definitely never got near them. But Apple changed all of that with this hot model. You don't see much of the wood ones anymore, but they were all the rage back in the day. And when I started, this is what was happening. In fact, when I started, floppy disks were actually floppy. And uh, why back in 85, we got to, we drew with this new thing called the mouse. This is even before 85. In fact, this is, Don, this is from your product way back, way back when, probably before, from the 70s, right? Yeah. And uh, that was it. You know, that was, that was the state of the art. And uh, that's where he made all his big bucks. And, uh, and then it got better. And uh, although it's a little hard to see the text here, but uh, this was the state of the art. And, you know, it's just, um, we had, you know, we had to, we had to, we drew with a mouse that was kind of like a block of wood, and you had to stop all the time and clean it. And uh, we had to, there was no, there was no uh, hard drive. So you had to, if you, you had to, when you played it, you had to start it with a, with a disc, and then you had to put in a disc to save what you were doing. So we're always doing the disco, you know, this is where disco came from, is it? we're just switching drives all day like this, you know. And um, I remember when I got my first external floppy disk drive, that was a big deal. And then I bought a hard drive. $700, 30 megabytes. <laughs> it was like, I thought I was pretty good. And now I've got a drive that's smaller than the end of my thumb that's four gigs. It's just amazing kind of where we've gone. So, so I don't want to hear any belly aching from your kids about how hard you have it, because we really had it hard. If I had a problem, we didn't, uh, we didn't get, go to the Genius Bar, or a thing called the Internet. <laughs> we had to scour the neighborhood to find somebody else who had a computer and knew a little about it. I remember banging on my dentist door at one in the morning, next to three houses away, going, I need another disk drive. I've been driving for three hours and forgot to say. <laughs> and, uh, I was working on Harvard San Diego games back then. So when I started, let's see what the next screen is. When I started, the, uh, there were eight or ten different graphic formats that you had to recreate every game in. So if you built a game like Harvard, you had to build it for each platform. There was CGA, EGA, VGA, Super VGA, Amiga, Commodore 64, Apple I, Apple II, Apple II GS. And then this baby came out. Yeah. That was slick. Yeah. One bit graphics. <laughs> but we were happy for it. And I, I, I just bring all this up because I, I just I don't want you guys complaining, you know, because we were able to all of a sudden jump into the next piece. And Eileen's not here um, to this time, but this was a, one of the first books that was. Um, had changeable text, it was a little older products, but it's from Voyager Company. And they look, you know, this looks pretty good, except when you realize that everything was drawn like pointillism. You had to go in and draw it pixel by pixel by pixel. Imagine how expensive the animation was. It was like a pain, but it worked. So, floppy disks. Um, another perspective from having been in the industry this long, as I've watched these waves come, and we were in floppy disks, and then we were a real, real hard floppy disk, and then, oh look, here comes, here comes a CD-ROM. But it was used as a storage device, it wasn't really playable, and then we turned it into a player, and meanwhile, you know, game platforms are coming up and down and going, and you just watch things coming, you know, from CD-ROM we didn't quite see the internet coming, or what it was gonna be completely. And from the internet, we, weren't, we didn't really see all the handhelds coming. And every one of these markets has a rise and a fall. And at the beginning of a market, you can make a lot of money, have a high profit margin, 
because it's all the early adapters are involved. So you have, um, I don't know if anybody remembers HyperCard on the Mac, but uh, Bill Atkinson, who uh, created the Mac interface, uh, created this authoring system for everybody, and showed it to his neighbor, Amanda Goodenough, who made a little story called Indico's Dream about her cat. And he showed it at the lunch. She sold 250,000 copies at $60 a pop of CD, run out of um, floppy disk that she made in her bedroom. You know? And I looked at it and said, Oh, I can do better than that, you know, which is some of where I went, I said, I gotta do I gotta do something else about books. But at the beginning of this arc, you see it over again, you know, and didn't I kick myself when I realized that people were making selling two hundred and fifty thousand copies of fart noises. Yeah, I missed that window, you know. And then the market matures, and then it matures some more, and then you get to where it's bigger players, the profit margins go down a little bit. And that's sort of where we're at now. We're in this place where it's harder to get seen. There's some consolidation, but the market size is getting huger. So this, and this talk is not about that, but it's just sort of interesting to watch these waves. I've watched five or six of them now, where you go, and I'm going, okay, I'm looking out. I was glad to hear Jesse's comments and other people's comments about what they think is where we're going, because until it's almost right in front of you, we almost don't see it. But... Let's see where are we. So, what can we learn from all these kids? We can learn. I can learn myself. Technologies come and go, and that it's not about the technologies. It's that all kids instinctively know how to and are drawn to and engage in play. Play is how kids learn. It's not about the technology. Kids have been playing for millennia. You know, even cats and dogs play. It's part of being a mammal. Play is a, man, a mammalian thing. It's how we learn, it's how we create uh, our relationship to the world. And we just happen to be making the current set of toys. So what's really important that I've seen after all these years is to understand about play. So think about um, an intrinsic pattern. So, you know, I had three boys, I had three grandsons, I've watched lots of kids in daycare centers and other kindergarten classes and everything over the years, and boys like to make things with blocks. Now girls do too, but it's somewhat more of a boy thing. And What's the next thing that happens? Knock Bang, knock them over. So here's an intrinsic play pattern that I can remember from me, from my friends, from I see it now in my grandkids. He didn't learn it from somebody. There's just something that makes you want to go and knock that thing over. So can you answer <laughs> what, what big product lately is using the same intrinsic trunk? Right. Angry Birds. This is intrinsic play meets technology. And it's a piece of where everybody can, they're tapping right into these older patterns of play, and it's a great product. Now, sometimes people go, well, you're ruining their homes, if you, you know, if you have empathy. And generally what they do in movies and in other games when they want to include the women more, is they have a reason. So, oh my God, those nasty pigs, they stole our babies. You know, the eggs are missing, that's the story. Now it's okay to go out and knock their houses down. And we see this in the movies all the time. This is the setup at the beginning of almost a lot of films, adventure films, action films. And, and the pigs are kind of snarky. So that when you don't, um, when you don't get them, they kind of go, <laughs> and that's an invitation emotional invitation to come and get you. They're goading you. So they're inviting you, they're inviting you, they're inviting you to come and play. So to a four-year-old, if this was a pile of vert of real blocks, how long would this be left standing in the living room? It wouldn't take long before he just plowed right through it. This is an invitation. So 
my first old timer tip is create invitations to play. <clears throat> that means there's something there that you, they can tell right away what it is. They can tell how to do it, they can tell how to get into it. Um, they, kids are just gonna, something that is hard for them to figure out. And then, you're also tapping into intrinsic play patterns. The best games are all about intrinsic play patterns. You can go back and look at almost anything and see what it is about the game that engages the child, that pulls them in, that makes them want to be part of it. That's, as Jesse was just saying so wonderfully, it piques their curiosity. Children are naturally curious. And what we want to do is we want to give them something to do with that curiosity. So, think about how learning is progressive. So, it's your first time, three years old, you're up on the top of the slide, and man, it looks like a long way down. And you're going to lose control. You've never been this high before. You've seen other kids do it, but this could be pretty scary. Some kids freeze up there and climb back down two or three times before they get around to being ready to go. But then, they go. And the next thing you know, they're going upside down and backwards head first. This is, you know, it might take a year, but it's just it's that piece about how mastery leads you to exploration. It leads you to experiment better. So you have to have a starting place, and then you go on to the next pieces. You know, and then the boys, you know, the, the older boys are going, oh, why don't I put my skateboard on You know, I mean, they're pushing it out farther and farther. And I know, because I tried all those things myself. And this is um, leveling. This is where leveling comes from. You start at a place of mastery where you feel confident, and then you push it a little farther. And then when they get mastery, they're still engaged, but you push it a little farther. So, um, so that's, that's kind of tied into those first two a little bit, but that I, I'm remembering, just remembering that piece of how going from one place takes you to the next place. And you know, that's, that slide could have been about curiosity because that mastery then makes you want to combine the pieces. What happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? Um, the I Ching says, to attempt something furthers one. Just the act of the experiment you learn something from. Win or lose, it doesn't matter. And in play, there's no winning and losing in play. There's not a score. There's not somebody else telling you, you know, the rules. Now when you get older, there's structured games. And you need rules for the older kids and structured game. But in general, if you're playing on the beach, if your kids watch kids make up games, there's really no winning and losing. The next old-timer tip in software design, or making any product for kids, is that you have to keep the child's eye view. Being a former kid doesn't count. You have to remember to get into their head, to come down, to, you know, walk around on your knees and see what the world looks like to them. A lot of people forget that kids under seven are primarily right hemisphere, which means they're not so logical. We often call that the the magic years, because tooth fairies and reindeers on the roof, they buy it all. And around seven, the left hemisphere kicks in, which is more logical and linear, and the next thing you know, the eight-year-old comes to the five-year-old and goes, Santa Claus isn't real. You know, they're, they're using the power of knowledge, but it, it shifts. This is why some of the best school systems in the world, like Norway and Sweden, don't even start kids reading until they're seven, because really, their facility to do that isn't quite ready. So the other part about having a child is that you have to know the design. Where are they developmentally? Which is about what I was just talking about. Where are they in the ages and stages? And how gender affects certain kinds of play. These are really key elements because you can't get into their point of view until, you're, until you can do that. And Barbara's uh, Chamberlain is often posting things that her younger kids say, and Darren sometimes too. And they make us laugh every time because they're out of the box, because they're not an adult point of view. So having the child's point of view 
is a key. Let's have this brief power of surprise. Surprise is one of the, I think, Rogers party, oh no, you know, they acted like they never liked it. But they did, because it was really touched to them. Because to the three-year-old, when he says, I like you, they go, you do? That's great, you know. Sesame Street learned that you could talk to the kids from the screen, and Blue's Clues made a business out of it. Where is it? Is it over here? And you hear other kids going, no, it's there, it's there, it's there. Um, or I worked with um, Beer in the Big Blue House for a year, uh, working on a, a, a product based on the TV show. How many people have seen Beer in the Big Blue House? Disney Channel. In the beginning of the show, Bear comes out, and he goes, hi, welcome to the show. And, I, and he starts sniffing, and then he goes, Wham, and he puts his face right up into the screen and, and goes, oh, were you having chocolate chip cookies this morning? <laughs> and he comes, or something like that. And the kids are going, no, you know. But I watch kids on the TV be sitting and watching, and they all go like this <laughs> when the bear gets close to the screen because it's, he's coming close to them. And when we put it on CD-ROM, we were, uh, and on the internet, we were interested when they react the same way. Yes, they did. Under six, over seven, they were like, oh yeah, that's kind of cool. So it's really important to know who your audience is. Keep a child's eye view. You have to get out of the producer head. You have to step out and you have to look at what is it that is interesting to them? What has their curiosity? How else can you approach a problem? And when you're, you know, there's blue sky creativity, which is like R&D. Yeah, we'll, we'll put this together with this, and we'll do this and that. And sometimes those guys have trouble shipping products. And there's producer creativity, which is like, you know, we get from point A to point B, we gotta make these changes, we're gonna do these things. It's very efficient, hopefully, and it's subtractive. And blue sky is additive. So you have to add things in, in the beginning. And when you're out in the child's eye view, the whole universe is magic. You know, um, I heard an interesting talk by Annie Lamont, the writer, and she got a, a bonus from one of her books, and she went down to uh, Club Med for the first time in her life, a family place where she could have, and she had her three-year-old son with her, and she was going to take tennis classes for herself, and she was going to, you know, fun things for him to do in the daycare center. Okay, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And they walk two steps out of the house, and he goes, oh, look, a bug, you know? And he's down on all four, looking at this bug. Ooh, look at that. And she's going, ah. And she said, going anywhere with a three-year-old is like going somewhere with somebody on acid, you know? <laughs> because, wow, everything looks cool, you know? Yeah. And that's coming into that other point of view. Surprise them in a good way. Magic and humor come from little moments that aren't expected. Adding that stuff in there is golden for keeping retention, keeping it funny, keeping them engaged. And my last one comes from Darren Karstens, who said, learning is fun. We just have to not screw it up. Thank you. And now, um, it's time for the official Duster Magic roll call. So it's my pleasure to introduce an old friend of Duster Magic. Well, uh, not old, a seasoned, uh, experienced friend of Duster Magic. Uh, 